Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Nadim Ruhana of Tuft University and we'll discuss the current negotiations that the Palestinians and the Israeli state are having, particularly Mohammed Abbas who seem to have made certain concessions regarding how uh, NATO forces or even the US forces could be stationed in West Bank in order for the Israeli forces to withdraw. Now, what are the major issues of uh, the current negotiations and how do you see it uh, panning out in the next few months? Right. Well, there seems to be four major issues that emerged as uh, uh, the central issues of uh, conflict in, in these negotiations. One of them is the presence of Israeli forces on the Jordan Valley that is the border between the future state now the West Bank, and Jordan. The second is the Palestinian capital, Jerusalem, in the eastern part of Jerusalem, which is now annexed to Israel. The third is how many settlements and how many settlers, how much territory Israel would keep uh, in a future agreement. And the fourth is the identity of the state of Israel, as a Jewish state, which Israel, as you know, has been recently demanding from the Palestinians to accept and recognize, not Israel as such, but Israel as a Jewish. Jewish state or the state of the Jewish people. So actually on all these four issues, they're, they're, my understanding and my sources tell me that there's no agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians or between the Palestinians and the Americans for that matter on the particular issue of the forces on the Jordan Valley uh, Abbas was arguing that if the issue is really security for Israel, well, then perhaps that could be resolved by having other forces than Israeli forces. We, there's no need for Israeli forces to be there. There could be either NATO forces or American forces. The most recent proposal was to have some American forces there. That's on that issue. I don't think that it's only the forces that's there. As you know, there is a string of settlements across over across the the Jordan Valley, very many Israeli settlements, and most of the land there is under Israeli control. And actually, some of the very interesting work that one UN uh, agency is doing there shows that Israel has been deporting the Palestinians from that part into other parts of the West Bank because it it doesn't have in its future plan uh, leaving that part of, uh, of the West Bank. Uh, one of Mr. Netanyahu's coalition partners called the Jewish House, Habayit Yehudi in Hebrew, uh, but that party openly argues for the annexation of that part of the West Bank into Israel because it has many settlements and doesn't have many Palestinians. So it doesn't threaten what is known in Israel as quote unquote the demographic threat that is the Arab Jewish composition of the population. On the other issues, there is no real agreement. I can, as you, you know, if you want, I can talk about any of them. The, the, coming to the fourth point that you mentioned, Israel as a Jewish state. Now, the US Congress has also passed resolutions saying precisely that that we have, the world should recognize, the Palestinians should recognize Israel as a Jewish state. The interesting part is this argument of an ethnic state is something that's really in common with, for instance, Nazi Germany, or you have uh, fundamentalist forces in different parts demanding that it should be Islamic state. And of course, you have also what are called Hindutva nationalists in India, who also demand that India should be Hindu state. These are all exclusionary nationalism, and we thought we had left it behind in the 20th century. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, the definition of, uh, uh, of Zionism as exclusionary nationalism is the right definition. Of course, with two additional elements. One of them is the religious element, which is similar to the Hindutva uh, movement here. And also, uh, it's, so it does make it a religious national movement. And that particular uh, segment of Zionism is increasing in power uh, tremendously 
in the recent in recent years. But it's also a colonial movement, right? So uh, the fact that the world, the Western world, although not of it, but to have the American president being a black president, American African president calling for the recognition of Israel or recognizing Israel openly as a Jewish state. I'm talking about that in the State of the Union address last month. Is, is quite disappointing to many people, to, to Palestinians and, and, and others who support the Palestinians, and precisely from the point of view that you presented, that this is ethnic exclusionary nationalism, and it's a recipe for continued conflict in the future. Palestinians uh, will not accept that for many, many, many reasons. Palestinians will not accept that for three obvious reasons and there are others. One, and the most fundamental, is that it negates history itself. This place is Palestine and it's for Palestinians and Palestinians existed there and the Zionist movement came from overseas occupied the place and established a state called Israel. Now to say that Israel is a Jewish state and recognize it as a legitimate state, that means that you are legitimizing colonialism as such. There's no nation on earth that will accept on itself to legitimize colonialism. Now Abbas knows that and there are many people, even if he personally wants to do that, there is so much resistance in the community that it would be very hard for him to accept it. Number two, think about the refugees who, whose cause is to return to their homes. And so once Israel is recognized as a, the Jewish state, so they will claim that, okay, it's a Jewish state, the Palestinian refugees will have to find somewhere else, not necessarily the Jewish state. So it closes that fundamental issue of where the Palestinian cause started, right? Number th three, think about it. It's between 16% to 20% depends how you count in Israel, because Israel has different levels of citizenship. So do you count the Palestinians in East Jerusalem, for example, or not among the Palestinians inside Israel? You have, let's say, about 20% who citizens or residents who are not Jewish. And to say that you are imposing on them a Jewish state, that means you are imposing in them permanent inequality. And the Israelis are very clear about that. They tell, and I happen to be a Palestinian from Haifa. That's the part of Palestine on which Israel was established. So for Israel to come and tell us, these Palestinians from there, that this is a Jewish state, the leaders also tell us that if you want to have any national aspirations, here's the Palestinian state next door. Just pack and leave. So this is very dangerous on all these levels, I do not see how that will, will be accepted. But at the same time, I must tell you, it's really disappointing to see the West pushing in that direction. Not all, not, not all of them. I mean, some, some are very careful, but the United States leadership in particular, American president who knows about the suffering of his own community and others in the United States, a multi-ethnic open democracy in which I, as a Palestinian, feel as part of the, of the community. So I can't feel as part of the community, of the political community, in my own original homeland, Palestine, but I can feel that in, the, in that state of that president who is calling on us to accept Israel as Jewish state. This is remarkable, actually re-establishment of legal, formal apartheid, if you accept that it's a Jewish state, because then automatically all non-Jews are different kinds of citizens. This is an acceptance in legal terms of a principle of apartheid state. Uh, well, I, I would say whether it's apartheid or not precisely, it's the same family of, of that uh, political regime. If you think about the regime now, the Israeli regime now in the West Bank, including the, the control of all of Palestine, in my mind, it's worse than apartheid because apartheid did not ask the native population of, uh, 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 of South Africa to say this is not your homeland, this is the homeland of the whites. Apartheid did have this governance of separation, right, the system of separation and superiority. 
but it didn't claim that this land is the land of the white. So you have a group coming and saying this land, including the West Bank, is the land of the Jews, of the Jewish people. So in that regard, that's on, the, on, the, on that level, but also on the practice, on the practical level of how the land is taken and how Palestinians are controlled and so on, there are practices that are worse than apartheid. Now, if there's a two-state solution and the identity of the state as Jewish state is accepted, I think you are also right, because these Palestinians, like myself, who, who are, of course, I, you know, I'm a professor at Tufts, but I'm also, I have my strong connections and my family and my research, and they go back and my home and so on. Palestinians, like myself, inside Israel, will be discriminated against constitutionally with the approval in a way of the world. And so I think you're right in that regard. The question of the two-state solution. Now, it does appear that having Gaza under the Hamas, having uh, the West Bank, rest of it under Fatah at the moment, the PA, it does appear that the Palestinian unity is broken, A, and B, Therefore, there is no pressure really on Israel to settle even the occupation of West Bank. Do you think that actually a two-state solution under such conditions where you already talked about the settlers taking over more and more of the land, the Jordan Valley that really completely on two sides encloses the West Bank. Under such conditions, do you think West Bank or a two-state solution is actually a viable Palestinian solution? I think it's it's increasingly less viable, but not only because, or not mainly because, of the Hamas control in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority under Fatah control in the West Bank. Because the working assumption among Palestinians is that if Palestinians can bring a good deal of two-state solution, then they can bring Hamas along. Incidentally, it's ironic that the Americans, on the one hand, want the Palestinians to reach an agreement with Israel, and they know that this agreement has to represent at least the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. At the same time, they are discouraging an internal agreement between the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, between Hamas and Fatah. So it's a very complicated game in which the authority is saying, okay, let's negotiate, and Hamas is agreeing, and let's see what you get. If you get a good deal, we'll see what we'll do. But the barrier to two-state solution is the agreement on these four issues that I mentioned, and that it doesn't seem, for example, that the Israelis are willing to concede a Palestinian capital in Jerusalem. So, and Palestinians see that that's sink uh, one on for an agreement. They can't go ahead with that without a capital in Jerusalem. And the other issues, and the settlements too. So the United States is really pushing. It's pushing very, very hard to reach an agreement because that is within the American strategic uh, uh, plan, uh, serves American interests. It's for many reasons, this is not our issue now. We, uh, we can talk about it if you want. But anyway, they are pushing very hard, but they're their pressure is asymmetric in the sense that, I mean, we can't look at the United States as a, as a neutral and uninterested uh, mediator. So their pressure, their main pressure is on the Palestinians, although they have some pressure on Israel. They are, they are putting some pressure on Netanyahu, and Netanyahu is resisting and using all his allies in the United States, the Congress and the pro-Israel lobby and so on, the fundamental Christian movement, but the main pressure is on the Palestinians on the four issues. Uh, now, think about what Palestinians would do. I mean, if they accept the American pressure, we don't know what we'll do. I don't think they will accept American pressure. But on these issues, if they accept it, I think the question would be whether the public will accept it. I don't think the Israelis will accept it. So the two-state solution is in trouble because of these, of the issues between Israelis and Palestinians, mostly. So even more than the two issues of the Jewish state and the uh, right to return and so on, the real, uh, also on the ground, while Abbas will find it impossible to accept, is that if the settlers stay, which is what 
to be Taniyahu is actually working for. And East Jerusalem is not conceded. East Jerusalem is not just East Jerusalem. It's also so many other parts which have been annexed now, which, is, which wasn't originally within East Jerusalem. So looking at that, it would be a non-viable state in any case, if they accept or under American pressure, a moth-eaten West Bank, as it were. I, I, you're, you're right. I, I mean, East Jerusalem is not East Jerusalem that it were. It changes by the day. The Judaization of Jerusalem is a priority for the Israelis. If you visited there each year, you will see changes. Uh, so it's an issue. The settlements, you know, Netanyahu made a statement that he, that is is controversial and it's not exactly what he meant. He said that perhaps some, some settlers can stay in a future Palestinian state. He was criticized for that and he kind of uh, withdrew that statement. No, no Israeli settlers can stay uh, in, in, the, in the Palestinian state. The issue is not whether only settlers can stay in the Palestinian state. When we talk about the settlers and the settlements, there are what's called the blocks of settlements, which in Camp David, nobody knew the exact percentage. In Camp David 2000, people were talking about 4 to 5 percent. Now it's more 10 or more percent of the land on which the settlements exist. And if you look at Jerusalem, that is the vast majority of East Jerusalem is now Jewish settlements. So these would be, and, and, and other, other parts of the West Bank and the heart of the West Bank would be annexed to Israel in return for territory to be negotiated and the percentage of the territory that Israel would concede to the Palestinians where the, uh, you know, the quality of the land and so on. Some be, desert land. Some desert land perhaps, perhaps in the uh, Napab, what's called the Negev, and, and, uh, and so on. So it's really that. And according to that plan, it would be very hard. It would be, it would be very hard for, for a viable uh, Palestinian state to exist. What do you think is a long-term strategy for the Palestinian people, given that the current range of negotiations, the current negotiations don't seem to be going anywhere, if these are the constraints? I'll tell you, I mean, as a student of that particular uh, conflict, and more recently of colonialism, I have been looking at if we, if we agree that Zionism is a form, is not only a form, is colonialism, it's a different kind of colonialism because Zionism did not have a, a motherland, right? But it is, these are people from the outside, under whatever ideology and whatever story they told themselves, that came to this land, claimed it as their own, took it over, expelled the Palestinians, right? And still practicing colonialism. If you look at the history of colonialism, I didn't find, I mean, I'm speaking in a TV interview, so if somebody would uh, prove me wrong, let me know. Settler colonialism, there is no case in history in which settler colonialism ended with partition. I mean, people uh, immediately tell me, well, how about Pakistan and India? This is not settler colonialism. It's a different kind of colonialism, right? It's a consequence of colonialism, but not settler colonialism. It's not settler sure. colonialism. So settler colonialism ended either in one state solution, the South African model, the expulsion of the colonists, the Algerian model, or the elimination of the natives, the North American model. Australian as well. Australian or North American model. I think the problem with Palestinians that I was mentioning to you just before this interview is that Palestinians always talked about colonialism. They left that paradigm for in the 70s when the two-state solution emerged. But when they talked about colonialism, in my mind, they adopted, they adopted the wrong model. They adopted the Algerian model. And I think when Palestinians get convinced that it's the South African model, right? And approach the world and uh, approach the colonizers themselves with that, uh, with that model as one state for equal citizenship, for Israelis 
and Palestinians, not for the Jewish people and Palestinians, for Israelis, because there is a nation that's called Israelis that was formed over the years, whether Palestinians want it or not, right? So I think that's the future. The future is to work towards that vision of one state, multi-ethnic, multinational, binational in this case, equality and citizenship as the as the anchor of belonging and the criterion of uh, the major component of citizenship. Reassertion of civic nationalism, that not this distorted variety of exclusionary nationalism which Zionism really is. Yes, I think that is, I mean, that's a way to put it. And, you know, the pressure towards not only that exclusionary nationalism to win, but also to be recognized and to be legitimized and to be, to be accepted by its victims, I think this is a recipe for conflict. And as, I, you know, as you know, I deal with conflict resolution, as you, you asked me, and as a student of conflict and conflict analysis, I can say with certainty that it's a recipe for continued conflict. People will not accept to be less equal. There is no people, there is no nation on earth who would accept to be less equal because another nation says we are, for whatever reason on earth, are more worthy than you are. And so this is why I say it with so much certainty that it's a recipe for continued conflict. I think the world doesn't think that way. Policies and politics of the United States is not about that. It's about the legacy of the president. It's about the internal dynamics of the relationship with Congress. It's about the next four years, the next turns, elections, and, and so on. It's about, uh, it's about maintaining the national interests of the United States in the big picture, the way they are perceived with the internal dynamics of, of pressure groups and so on. These are the, it's not, it's not, it's not about what's just and what's not just in the world. And, the, you know, people in conflict think differently. And justice is a component we have to take into consideration. And hopefully the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement will gain more and more traction. And hopefully the internal politics of the United States and other Western countries who are backing the Israeli Jewish state formula We'll have to rethink on it, but that's something which is more long-term that we have to see. Thank you very much, Professor Ruhana. It's been a pleasure talking to you and hope to see you again in India. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure.